Let's do this first. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time together tonight. Heavenly Father, God, we are just so thankful that we can come to you knowing you by your word, seeing you, seeing your character, how it is that you minister, how it is that you care, how it is, Lord, that you would go before us if we would but let you. And so, Lord, this evening, as we've come together, I ask that we would open our hearts and minds to receive everything that you have for us, that we would look at the examples that are put before us and recognize that, Lord, while this was written about a different time, oh, Lord, it works in our time. And so, Lord, we're thankful that we can come together, that we can worship you, lifting up our voices and our hands to heaven in praise of the one true and living God. We thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John 16, 33 says this, These things I have spoken to you, that you may in me have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. As we continue in our study in Jeremiah, I am just nothing short of amazed at the timing that could not be more on the spot as the Lord speaks to us through His Word. But I have to say I'm blown away completely about the relevancy, relevancy that we see in relationship to what's happening right now in the world around us. And with this in mind, I want to take just a moment and I want to remind you, as I often need to be reminded, of something that is easily forgotten. Jesus has overcome. Say amen. amen. He's overcome. And more and more as we continue in the circumstances of our day, it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to even get angered over what's happening in our state and in our nation. Much of this anger is driven by fear, and I believe that at times it's fear because we might think or somehow believe that evil is winning over good. Christian, listen. Jesus cannot lose. Those that are in Him cannot lose. The war, it's already been won. He's told us ahead of time. He told us ahead of time about this time. Why? Well, He wants us to have peace. He wants us to understand that as He has shown us what is going to happen, as we see what's taking place, yes, is there tribulation in the world? Absolutely. In the world, around the world, throughout the world, So if lately you've found yourself beaten up, beaten down, angered, afraid, be of good cheer, for Jesus has overcome. In 1922, a lady by the name of Helen Lamel was writing songs for, well, he was a little-known but soon-to-be extremely well-known pastor evangelist of the day, a guy by the name of Billy Sunday. Anybody ever heard of that guy? Yeah. He was a little influential at that particular point in time. Things were rough in 1922. There were all kinds of issues and problems socially and culturally and even in the physical realms of things that were going on. It was not a good time for the country in relationship to hardship. And she penned this song, and it says, Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. And oh, this is the part that you'll remember. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of this earth, earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Guys, we've got to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Don't allow the things that are happening, even as tonight we go through and we see and we go, wow, this is clipped right from the headlines. Yes, it is. 
It's the very same thing that was happening then that's repeating and happening now. But Jesus has told us ahead of time. Why? So that we would have peace. So that we wouldn't fall apart. So as we continue, remember that we stand in His grace. Amen? Amen. In verse 1 of chapter 36 of Jeremiah's message, it says, Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all of the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And so the Lord comes to Jeremiah and he says, I want you to write this down. Now, he was already writing it down. I mean, obviously, he must have written something down or we wouldn't have the book of Jeremiah. There's a chronicle. But he wants Jeremiah to write specifically the words that he's, that he's calling. And he says, I want you to write down everything that I'm saying specifically concerning Israel and Judah and the other nations' rebellion. Basically, the Lord says, I want you to write a part that will be the Bible. I want you to write this stuff down so that people may read it and turn back to me. The Lord's desire was not destruction for Judah. The Lord's desire was not destruction for Israel, but restoration. His desire is that people would turn from evil so that he can forgive their sins and their iniquity. It says, Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on the scroll of the book at the instruction of Jeremiah all of the words the Lord which he had spoken to him. There's always those that like to claim that the Bible is not God's word because it was written by man. You ever heard anybody say, well, it's just a collection of writings by, by men. How can you say that it's God's word? Well, this is the process that God uses when he decides to have something written on his behalf. The Word of God comes through men. It comes by inspiration. God speaks to Jeremiah. He then in turn speaks to Baruch, and Baruch writes it down. That's how it works. In 2 Timothy in 3 and 16, we know that it tells us that all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God, that it's profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and for instruction of righteousness. So God tells Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells Baruch. Baruch writes it down. Pretty simple, isn't it? Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined, and I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction, the words of the Lord, in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities, that it may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord, and everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading from the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Jeremiah has yet to be, we will see it happen, but yet to be imprisoned at this time. But most likely he had been banned from the temple. They didn't like his message. They didn't like his words. The things that he was saying was not in line with what the think of the culture was. So they were doing everything they could to silence him. And so he sends Baruch out to read that which he's written. And it says, Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Jesse, king of Judah, in the ninth month that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people of Jerusalem and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Then Baruch read the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Jeremiah, the son of Saphon, the scribe, in the upper court, at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. He did this in the hearing of all the people. When I get to heaven, I want to talk to Baruch. I want to meet this guy. 
I mean, this guy was a warrior. I mean, he's a scribe. He's writing things down. He was kind of, kind of Jeremiah's secretary, right? I mean, most failed boss ever, right? I mean, Jeremiah didn't get any traction on his message. He had been up to this point in time accused of, of not, only, not only treason, but he'd been issued death threats. He was told he needed to be quiet. He was anything but popular. The people in his own hometown wanted to kill him. And so here's the idea. Your boss in this position comes to you and say, hey, I can't go into the blender, so I'm sending you. And this guy goes, I love this guy. When Mihai Yahu, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Saphan, heard all of the words in the Lord's house, he then went down to the king's house into the scribe's chamber where all the princes were sitting. Elisamiah, scribe, Deliah, the son of Shem, Amiah, El Nathan, the son of Abkor, Germiah, the son of Saphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the princes. You go home and practice these later too. <laughs> then Mihai Yahu declared to all the words that he had heard when Baruch read in the hearing of all the people. Therefore, all the princes, Yehudai, the son of of Nathaniah, the son of Shalemehu, the son of Cushai, to Barak, saying, Take in your hands a scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand, and he came, and he said to him, Sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Baruch read it all, and he read it in their hearing. Baruch reads a scroll in a temple, and he gets the attention of the princes. These would have been the, the, the local leaders, the, the politicians, if you will, the legal leaders, the religious leaders. These were the, the, the up-and-comers, the princes, those that were tied to and related to the system of rule. And now it happened when they heard the words that they looked in fear from one to another and said to Baruch, we will surely tell the king all these words. Now understand, this isn't a Oh, we're going to tell the king what you said. It's like, no, no, no. We need to let the king know the words that are being spoken. And they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us, how did you write all of these words at his instruction? So Baruch answered and said, He proclaimed with his mouth all of the words to me, and I wrote them down with ink in the book. Then the princess said to Baruch, Go and hide. See, they knew he was in trouble you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. At this time, and this is where, where I see things that are just so important, at this time there were still those in leadership that were willing to do the right thing. There were still those in leadership that were willing to listen to the Word of God. Not all of the leaders at this point in Judah's history had gone over and surrendered, if you will, to that which was ungodly. And folks, I believe that this is where we see our society and our culture and even our government on the edge right now. As we continue to see the church and the people of God marginalized, I believe that there's just a very short period of time before the total removal of anything of God is upon us. I believe that that is the intention and the desire of the culture is to remove God from His place of rightful lordship. And it's why we have to stand up. It's why we have to continue to proclaim the word of God or risk seeing it removed completely. Look at what happens next. And they went to the king in the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elismia, or Emma, the scribe, and they told all the words in the hearing of the king. So the king said to Jehede to bring the scroll, and he did from Elismia the scribe's chamber. And Jehada read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. So you get the picture. They go to the king and they don't bring the scroll, but they go to the king and they say, king, this is what was said. This is what the, the prophet shared. This is the words that came out. And he says, go get the scroll. I want to see it. 
Go get it and bring it to me. So they go down where it's been stored in the chambers of one of the priests, and they bring it up, and they read it before the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth. And until the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth, and yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of the servants who heard all these words. I read a headline the other day. Portland protesters burn Bibles. An American flag outside the federal courthouse. I don't know how many of you saw that, but there was a process by which those that were protesting brought stacks of Bibles and literally created a bonfire with the Word of God in front of the courthouse in Portland. Now, it does not shock me in any way, shape, or form that there would be a group of radical socialists that want to tear down everything that this country stands for. It doesn't surprise me, but what concerns me greatly is that in the highest offices of the land, there has been silence from many on the issue of desecrating the Word of God and the symbol of the freedoms that He provides to this nation. I think it's amazing that if we as Christians in this country at this particular point in time were to take the writings of, say, another prophet and burn it in the streets that the news caption would say Christians promote hate and violence against whatever group it would be. Not only was this tolerated, it was embraced as a free expression of speech. Guys, we're so close. (laughs) We're so close that for so many, they don't understand, they don't reason, they don't recognize what's happening in this generation and in this time. What we're seeing in the streets is the same thing that was happening in the king's palace when the word of God was being burned and the people had no fear. No fear. Folks, we're going to find ourselves as a nation in the same place as Judah if we don't confess, if we don't turn from our sin and call out to God to forgive the sins of this nation. And I don't, I, I don't think that there would have been a time in my life that I ever thought that I would have said that specifically about an instant time. We've seen it coming. Guys, the time is here. It's now. When those that are burning in the streets of this country, oh, now we've seen this. It happened in Nazi Germany. It happened in the USSR. It happened in Russia under communist rule where Bibles were brought, where books and literature that talked about an almighty God were brought into the public square and burned in order to demonstrate that they were stronger than the God that these people believed in. Oh, if it was a one-off, that would be one thing. I mean, we've seen people burn flags and step on them and burn by them. I mean, we've seen that happen. This is something that's in front of the national eye. This is something that half of the leaders in this country, if not more, have failed to recognize and condemn. If for no other reason than the fact that it's hate speech, if we were to do it, it would certainly be labeled as such. We need to be aware of what's happening. Yet, they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king, nor any of his servants who heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elnathan, Delii, Jeremiah, implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen. And the king commanded Yerachmael, the king's son, Sariah, and the son, Azariah, and Shia Mehu, the son of Abedel, to seize Barak, 
the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. There were still some that implored the king not to do it. Not to burn the word of God, but he says that, they, that he didn't listen. And folks, right now, we have a leader in this country that's willing to stand up for the word of God. There is a leader in this country that is willing to stand up for the word of God. And I am concerned that if there's any exchange of power, if there's any change in administration as we look going forward, that we're going to see the Word of God not only removed, but labeled as hate speech and banned in the public square by the potential of an incoming new progressive and liberal administration. And again, you know me, I don't shrink back from things that are in front of us, and I don't want to just focus completely on this aspect of, of what's happening politically, guys, but this is more than a political challenge. This is the Word of God being desecrated in a country that up to this point in time has stood on the principles of the Word of God. We're at a turning point. Now, after the king burned the scroll with the words of Baruch, the words of Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Take yet another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. And you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, You have burned this scroll saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land? And because man and beast to cease from here. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out into the heat of the day and the frost of the night, and I will punish him, his family, and his servants for their iniquity, and I will bring on them on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all the men of Judah, all the doom that I have pronounced against them, but they did not heed. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and he gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned in the fire beside. There were added to them many similar words. Guys, understand, the word of God is not subject to destruction by man. The word of the Lord endures forever. The word of God is held above his name. Isaiah 40 and 8 says that the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Regardless of what man does, God's word remains. The scary part is for those who would disregard it or think that somehow by destroying it or burning it that it somehow Oh, would cause it to be canceled out and not have any power? You see, the only reason that those that are taking and burning Bibles in the streets would do so is they think that somehow or another, by doing so, they're removing God. Man, are they in for a rude awakening. But what do we do about it? You know, one of the things that has been so amazing in this in this country up to this point in time. And now you watch what's, what's going to be the, the outcome and the moving forward on this, this whole aspect of this cancel culture that we see. As soon as the removal of God's Word, because it's offensive, becomes popular, watch the Word of God start disappearing in the places where you found it regularly. They'll no longer have it on the bookstores and Walmart or even the dollar store that's had... Bibles for years and years. You've got to be careful because they miss pages. I, that's why they're a dollar. One place that I know won't quit distributing Bibles is the Gideons. Isn't that right, Doyle? We're going to keep getting Scriptures out there. But it may come a time where Bibles literally become contraband in this country. I see, we can't fathom that. It's like, wait a minute. Man, I can't walk into any store anywhere. I can't go into somebody's house and they got two or three Bibles. Some of you got Bibles you don't even use. Right? 
Old ones, big, you got that big family Bible that, you know, everybody wrote in, but nobody ever opened up and read. That which offends, it's got to go, according to the cancel culture. And that's where we're headed, and that's what we see taking place. And this was the very thing that was taking place in Judah at this time, as they took what was the Word of God and they disregarded it, thinking that somehow or another... <laughs> Jehoiakim thought by throwing the word of God in the fireplace that he'd removed God. God comes back through Jeremiah and says, no, you go tell him that I've got a message for him. It's not going to be pretty. And not only that, he will not have to succeed him, anyone in his family that will reign in the place of David's throne. Now, King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. From Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made him or made king him king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jehoiakim's son is also what we would have learned by name, called Jehoiachin. And we talked about how, how he was one of these guys that got to rule for like three months. So when Jehoiakim died, his son went in, and he was there for three months before Nebuchadnezzar came in and replaced him with Zedekiah, because Zedekiah was a puppet king. And the word of the Lord came true that there would not be a son of Jehoiakim ruling on the throne of David. He was removed, and never again was there anyone from his direct bloodline that ever saw their place within the kingdom. And Zedekiah sent to the king, or and Zedekiah the king sent Yahuel, the son of Shemehu, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and the prophet, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. Now Jeremiah was coming and going among the people, for they had not yet put him in prison. Zedekiah was not a godly king. But desperation drove him to ask Jeremiah to pray for him. It's interesting because it's amazing how from time to time I'll have folks that want me to pray for them because of their desperation, not because of their dedication. And while desperation is a good reason to call out to God, if it's not going to be followed by dedication, then it's pretty much so a matter of being a self-serving prayer. And this is what Zedekiah was doing. He wanted to see if he could get the prophet on him. Can you go talk to God? Can you go get him to change his mind? Then Pharaoh's army came up from Egypt. And when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard the news of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Now, you remember, we talked about this historically. We talked about how there was a period between the first siege and the final siege to where Egypt massed an army and came up on Judah's behalf to confront Babylon. And when they started coming up from the south, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, pulled off the siege of Jerusalem to go encounter them and to go face them. And during this time, it was thought that there was some sort of reprieve, there was some sort of deliverance, and those that were inside Jerusalem and those especially in leadership thought that a miracle had taken place. God must be favoring them now because all of a sudden the threat was gone. The Chaldeans have pulled off. The siege is over. They were able to go outside. They were able to, to reestablish re some normalcy to life. Things have returned Things are good. But they weren't. Because the problem still existed. And guys, this is a warning that I want us to have in relationship to our mindsets and going forward. We, we're looking to the end of the year for solutions. Praying for solutions at the end of the year. Let me tell you what, what happens at the end of the year is not the solution. The solution is the people of this country need to turn to God. That's the solution. Oh, there might be a reprieve. It might be that the Chaldeans pull the siege off for a little while to go engage somewhere else, but understand, they're coming back. We need to be so careful that we don't think that somehow or another 
that a temporary reprieve will solve the problems of a nation that rejects the living God. Then the word of the Lord came to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, You shall say to the king of Judah, who sent you to me to inquire of me. I think this is so cool. God knows that Zedekiah went to Jeremiah. Hey, go back. I know he came and he asked you to ask me a question. Here's my answer. You need to send this response to him. Behold, Pharaoh's army, which has come up to help, will return to Egypt, to their own land. And the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against the city and take it and burn it with fire. Thus, says the Lord, do not deceive yourself, saying, the Chaldeans will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. For though you had defeated the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remained only wounded men among them, they would rise up, every man in his tent, and burn the city with fire. The Lord tells Jeremiah, go back and tell the king he's not out of hot water. You go back and you tell the king that this Egyptian army that he paid to come up and, 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 and be a protection agent for, for Jerusalem. Remember, he emptied the coffers. He emptied the, the, the treasury in order to buy protection from Egypt. And Egypt comes up and they make a stand and they get close enough to look. And if you go back and you read the history books, the king, uh, the, the, the pharaoh that was in place at the time took one look at the army of the, the, the Babylonians and he went, we're out of here, man. Turned around and went home turned around and went home and started looking at how it was that he could protect his kingdom. He just gave up on Jerusalem. And the Lord says, you don't understand. You're not fighting against Babylon. You're fighting against me. And guys, we're in the same place in this nation right now. The fights that are happening right now aren't against political ideologies, social and cultural ideologies. This nation, and don't in any way, shape, or form, think it's anything but is at war with God Almighty. And those that are called by His name, those that are faithful, and those that are, that, are, that are secured to Him need to rise up and make a stand, or we're going to see something totally different than anything that we've ever seen in this country before. When we see what's happening, and we see the continued presence of, of the abominations that are happening in our culture and in our society, when we see people continuing to not only support but now celebrate those abominations to the point that the church is closed and the casinos are open, to the point that the Word of God is expendable and can be burned in the streets and the Christianity is marginalized in a country that's supposed to be a Christian nation. Understand that we're not just fighting the battle against the mindset, God himself is going to remove his hand of protection from this country. What it does for us, oh, those that are in him, remember, he's already won the war. Perfect opportunity to grab as many people as we can with the grace and the salvation message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? It happened when the army of the Chaldeans left the siege of Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army that Jeremiah went out to Jerusalem or out of Jerusalem to go into the land of Benjamin to claim his property among the people. And when he was there at the gate of Benjamin, the captain of the guard was there whose name was Uriah, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah, the prophet, saying, You are defecting to the Chaldeans. Then Jeremiah said, false, I am not defecting to the Chaldeans, but he did not listen to him. Now you remember, God told Jeremiah to go buy a worthless piece of property. Were you here for that study? Right? He told worst real estate deal ever. Go back to your hometown, buy this piece of property that right now is under Babylonian control. You don't know if you're ever really going to get it back yet. But that was the whole point. He wanted Jeremiah to buy the property because God had promised restoration. He says, I want you to put your money where your mouth is, or should we say your money where God's mouth is. God's, 
mouth had promised restoration and to bring them back into the land. And he told Jeremiah, go buy this piece of property as evidence that you too believe that I'm going to restore and it's going to be returned to you. But as he goes home, he gets to the gate of the city and the captain of the guard goes, traitor, you've sold out to the Chaldeans, man. I've heard your message. You're not welcome here. And rather than just not being welcome, what he does is he takes and he arrests him. So Uriah seized Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Therefore, the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him, and they put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they had made that the prison. Now, it's interesting because if you, unless you really look at this and understand and look at timelines, you may not realize this, but it had been some 15 years between the incident where the princes were mentioned in the last chapter. This was a new generation of princes. Those that didn't care or have any regard for Jeremiah's message. Now you remember the last princes at least tried to stand and tried to take a, a, a position with the king as he burnt the word of God. They said, don't do this. And it said the princes had listened to the words and it caused them to have fear and they still had something in their heart that was turned towards the Lord. But now... This new generation has absolutely no regard for the Word of God. This new generation has no regard for the messenger of God. Neither do they have for the rule of law or the rights that Jeremiah would have had under the law. Do you see the parallel? I mean, is, is, is it just me? Am I just reading this and I'm inundated, inundated with it so much that I just look at this and I go, wow, this sounds just like what's happening here, isn't it? We need to listen. Because what is happening in this country, I, I, I fear, puts us one generation, one generation from the total dismantling of what we would recognize as a godly America. Just one generation. We're seeing the rights that we have so long held as the bedrock of this country. I never thought in my lifetime that I would ever see a time when the government would come and shut down the churches. Well, we talked about it. I mean, we've been preaching on it for years. I mean, I can remember standing in this very pulpit and saying that if they come through the door and if we have to die for what we believe, then we'll do so. Were you here when I said that? Have you heard that said somewhere else? It isn't that I didn't think it would happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen so quickly. I didn't know if I'd see it in my lifetime, and I, I, I think we're there. I think we're at the point, obviously, to where now, rather than the government recognizing that they have no authority over God, the government is trying everything they can to exercise authority over God. I fear that this nation is headed for the same bondage that we see Judah headed for, for the exact same reason. I would love to think that Jesus is going to return before that happens, wouldn't you? <laughs> you guys down for that? <sighs> Come get us out of here. Beam me up, Jesus. There's no intelligent life on this planet. But if the Lord tarries, things have the potential to change drastically in this country. Beyond anything that we would have ever thought. Oh, and I know we're not citizens of this world. Our citizenry is in heaven. And there's those that say, well, we're just passing through. We're just so sojourners. Why would we be concerned? Why don't we just huddle down and just do church? And even if we have to go underground, that's okay. We'll just wait for the Lord to come back. Because that's not what he told us to do. The Lord didn't tell us to run and hide. He said to go and spread the gospel. He didn't say cover and conceal. He said reach out and heal. <laughs> He, he, he didn't tell us to, to shy away. He told us to stand up, to speak up, to be light to the world. And we are surrounded by the darkness in this world. And there is but one light, and that light is Jesus Christ. And as the keepers of that light here, if we don't let it shine, 
It's not going to. You see, remember, I started with a very uplifting word because this is a hard message. It's hard because God, we're already just big pastor. Come on. Can't you just, can we go to a happy verse? Can, can, can't, we just, can't we just go somewhere else in Scripture? No. Well, sure we can. Here we go. You ready? Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name <laughs> will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Guys, we're the remnant. We're the remnant. And as we would do all that is within us to be faithful, we need to remember that there are so many that are out there that are in need of understanding that complacency is not an option. There is no other solution. Either as a country we return to God or we go into bondage. When Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells and Jeremiah had remained there many days, then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out and the king asked him secretly in his house, and he said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is! And the king said, Great, what is it? I'm paraphrasing. You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. <laughs> no! That's not the word I was looking for! Zedekiah pulls Jeremiah out of the the, the prison that he's in, where he's been beaten and where he's been struck and where he's been starving. And he says, now what is the Lord telling you about the situation? Now it would have been really easy for Jeremiah to say, things are going to get better, king. Tomorrow's a new day. Sun will come up tomorrow. It's going to be great. Things are going to get better. Hey, the siege is over. Things are going to go good. Why don't you just you know, have these guys kick me loose and everything will be fine and I'll just go on, on my way. No. There's word. You're going to be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Moreover, Jeremiah said to King Zedekiah, What offense have I committed against you? Against your servants or against the people? What have you, that, that you have put me in prison? Where now are your prophets who prophesied to you saying, the king of Babylon will not come against you or this land? Therefore, please hear now, O my lord the king. Please let my petition be accepted before you and do not make me return to the house of Jonathan because they're going to kill me. Jeremiah says to the king, I'm really the only prophet out there that's telling you the truth. Where are all your other prophets? Where are those that, that, are, that are also telling you that everything's going to be okay? How come they're not in prison with me? How come this isn't, isn't all prophets go to, go to prison? How come it's just the one with the truth? Why is it that everybody else gets to play by one set of rules and I'm being subjected to another set of rules? But then he petitions the king. Jeremiah was just a man like you and I are. He was concerned for his own well-being, his own safety, and he was being miserably treated. He was being literally starved to death and beaten to death on a daily basis in this prison within this administrator's house. And he goes to the king and he says, can you at least not send me back to Jonathan's house because they're going to kill me. Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah to the court of the prison and that they should give him daily a piece of bread from the Baker Street until all the bread in the city was gone. Thus, Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Guys, I don't know what's going to happen next year. If you would have asked me in January... What was going to happen this year? I could not have given you any of the things that we're seeing happening. I had, 
We have no idea. Never would have thought that we would have been living through what we are living through now. But what I do know, I know that whether it's this year, last year, next year, God is in control. God has a plan. The Word of God endures forever, is unchanging, and immovable. My hope and my prayer is that we would see this time as a means by which to lead God's people in crying out. That each and every one of us would take, take it and have it be a, a personal mission within our own service of the Lord to engage other believers, to, to engage those that are marginal, to engage those that aren't paying attention to what's happening and say, we need to pray. We need to be vocal. We need to be those that are standing up for the Word of God so that it doesn't disappear from sight, so that they don't get to the place to where the King is burning the Word of God and no one has any fear. Whatever comes, with every breath that is within me, with every ounce of strength that I have, from here, as long as we're able, we will proclaim the Word of God and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? That we will do. That we will do. Doors open, inviting, welcoming, because... This is Jesus Christ's church. He opened it, only He can close it. And to this point, the door remains open because He has placed before us an open door. Amen? Amen. Amen. Remember this. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, we come before your throne of grace. <sighs> Lord, for much of what we see happening, Lord, it's, it's shocking, it's terrifying. But yet, Lord, you've told us that these things must happen, that there are times to come when Absolutely good will be called evil and evil will be called good. Lord, I, I, just, I just really sense that we never thought that we would see it upon us to this degree. Lord, we'd hoped that there were things in place, that there was reason and more good in the hearts of men than what we're seeing today. But it doesn't change you as God. It doesn't change you and it doesn't change your word. And as we see, by way of example here with Jeremiah, how he continues, I, I love this. Is there any word from the Lord? Yes, there is. You're going down. The word from the Lord is that his conditions for surrender have not changed. Surrender and salvation only come through Jesus Christ. Not through a political movement. Not through chaos in the streets. Not through who wins or who loses or what is promoted or through the attempts to destroy God by destroying His book. No. The terms of God's surrender and salvation remain the same. Faith in Jesus Christ. The only true and living God. The way, the truth, and the life. So Lord, we ask that you would just continue to strengthen us. Give us opportunities. Put us in that place, Lord. It's not all about raging in battle, Lord. It's about speaking a kind word. It's a, about ministering to a lonely heart, to a feeble heart, to a scared heart, to an anxious heart. And Lord, they're all around us, ministering to them the love and the grace and the mercy that you would show to us if we would but ask. 
The whole purpose for Jeremiah writing it down was so that the people would read it, turn from the evil, and receive forgiveness and salvation. And Lord, that's our prayer for this country and for all that are in it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.